Good day, uh, it may be morning, afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Um, I welcome you all to the uh, next um, webinar. It's our 18th webinar on local and subnational government uh, advocacy work. Um, and my name is uh, Ingrid Kutsia, and I am the, the chairperson of this, uh, this webinar today, but I'm also going to be doing a lot of the presentations. Um, and we're going to focus today on giving you an update on recent and uh, forthcoming events. Um, and I think that there's quite a lot to report on. Um, and um, also we will have a, a presentation, a very brief presentation by uh, Ms. Kobe Brunt, uh, who's going to just speak to the um, CBC high level event at the past Daring Cities. Uh, event. So um, just to recognize the various partners um, in the uh, global advocacy movement for local and subnational governments, there are a lot of institutions that are involved in this uh, um, on behalf of the global task force uh, of local and regional governments, um, where ICLE plays a central role as coordinating on the specifically around the CBD and related processes. And we also just like to recognize the uh, support and contribution um, from the um, EU Biodiversity Framework Support uh, Project as well. Um, just to uh, mention that, um, as I said, this was the 18th webinar uh, today. Um, we have one last webinar for this year, which will take place early in, in December. Um, the links to this webinar are available on our website. Um, and um, I will ask one of my technical staff just to share that link with you before in the chat box before the end of our webinar so that you can register for our next webinar again. And also just to mention that we repeat the same webinar this afternoon at 3 p.m. Um, Central Time, Central African Time. And the reason why we do that is so that we can cater for people that are in other time zones as well. So, as I said, what we're going to focus today is just giving you a, a formal a sort of report back, um, but I'm also going to just briefly outline some of the work and the more recent uh, um, outcomes and findings on the mainstreaming of biodiversity advisory, informal advisory group. Uh, there was a workshop uh, in early in October, and I will give a presentation on that. Um, and then we're also going to talk a lot about uh, both Daring Cities and uh, the LOX uh, Congress, which is actually going on at this very moment. Um, so just quickly uh, to just recap on this very exciting roadmap to COP, um, the um, latest update is that uh, there still isn't final clarity on dates for the scientific meeting, the SAPSTA meeting, or the implementation meeting, the SBI meeting. These have uh, tentatively been scheduled for early next year. Uh, there was some talk that initially, you will remember, we wanted to, there, there was some talk that those meetings were going to be held at the end of this year, but um, it's not going to be possible. Uh, there is still not 100% clarity yet around uh, whether these are going to be online or virtual sessions. Obviously, the, the ongoing situation around COVID is having a huge impact on the ability to meet and the type of meetings and when these meetings will take place. Um, but we are assured by the, um, the SCBD, the Secretariat, that they are working on this and trying to finalize those dates. So for now, it looks like it'll probably be in the early quarter of next year. Um, there's also no finality yet uh, um, on the IUCN World Con uh, Conservation Congress. Those dates are still to be confirmed. Um, and likewise, also the open-ended working group three meeting that is going to take place in Colombia, uh, that has also not been finalized yet um, in terms of whether it's going to be, where it'll, uh, when it'll be and whether it's going to be virtual or online. So the soon as we have a final or further uh, updated information, we will keep everybody updated. And then of course, this also has implications for the CBD COP, uh, which will probably take place uh, later uh, in next year. Um, and associated with that is the uh, seventh Biodiversity Summit for Cities and, and Subnational Governments, which is one of the uh, official parallel events at the CBD COPs. 
Um, and then just quickly to give you a bit of an update, um, this is uh, information that was shared with us, shared to us by um, uh, Basile von Haav, who is one of the co-chairs of the Open Ended Working Group. And what it essentially shows you is what their planning is in terms of moving forward on the global biodiversity framework. Uh, some of you may be aware that um, the open-ended working group recently uh, shared uh, um, an update of the zero draft of the global biodiversity framework. Uh, they are continually working on this and um, obviously the planning now for the period from basically now sort of this latter part of this year uh, to early uh, February 2021 is and that's in that period where they are hoping to have the uh, SAPSTA and SBI meetings um, they're working on um, a report, um, both to the SAPSA, which will be the more technical report, and then also a report to the SBI, which will focus more on the implementation aspects. And those will be presented at the respective SAPSTA and SBI meetings wherever they take place. Um, and there's a, a, a couple of issues that they've uh, identified. You can see on the slide there, for example, looking at issues around indicators, numerical values, availability of baseline information, which is obviously the more technical information. And then insofar as the, the implementation side of things is concerned, uh, a lot of the discussion there is more around um, the language, the sort of principles that one looks at and looking at the type of decisions uh, and, and fleshing those out. So the idea is that there would be a next version, a draft one uh, in the course of, of next year, which that would then lead into the open-headed working group. And that obviously builds up to, to COP15. Uh, and as I said, the, the timeframes of these are still subject to finalization. Um, and I, at this stage, I want to hand over to um, Ms. Kubi Brandt, um, who's going to talk to us uh, just about the uh, high-level event that the Cities Biodiversity Centre organised recently at Daring Cities. And um, it's a great pleasure to um, have Kubi on our webinar. She is an old, um, well, let's say somebody that has been in many of our webinars, so she will be very familiar to, to most of our audience today. Um, and for those of you that do not, uh, have not yet uh, met Kubi, and this is your first webinar, um, Kubi is um, the um, di Global Director of the ICLE Cities Biodiversity Centre, which is based in Cape Town. She's also the Regional Director of ICLE Africa. And I'm very proud to say that very recently Kubi was appointed as an, a new Deputy Secretary General of ICLE globally. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Kubi. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you so much um, for this opportunity and to be with you. Um, I think I was I was part of the very first few webinars, and um, every now and then I have the honor and the pleasure to to pop into these webinars once again. Um, I think what we've seen over the last months is that um, a formidable amount of knowledge has been shared on this platform, and I want to congratulate everybody, those people who come regularly. And also maybe those people who come for the first time today to join us here in this uh, what we what we now fondly refer to as as the advocacy lounge really um, where we have our coffees together uh, twice a day once a month um, um, with a lot of friends with a lot of other networks city networks cities themselves regional government networks um, and reports from out in the field, um, scientists, etc. So thank you very much for this opportunity, Ingrid, to be with you. I've got the pleasure today just to report very briefly on a very high level event that took place. And what's significant about it is that uh, Daring Cities um, is a first for ICLE. Um, it, it spanned over three weeks of online virtual congressing and uh, or conferencing and um, it was a leap of faith for us as a global organization to transition completely to a virtual world and I must say it was a resounding success. Um, the What makes this session and the other nature inputs into Daring Cities so really exceptional 
um, and important, I think, is that Daring Cities was really focused on climate action. Daring Cities uh, was all about the race to zero, low carbon development, climate financing, um, uh, resilient development, nature-based solutions in the context of climate, but then also there was room made realizing that the climate crisis and the nature crisis absolutely go hand in hand, and one cannot solve the one without solving the other. So um, there was a great recognition from not only from MICLI, but also from all the other partners, the UNFCCC, all the UN agencies that were there, the funders, the partners, we partnered, of course, with the city of Bonn, North, uh, North Rhine-Westphalia states in Germany, and the German government to make this all possible, and many, many other partners. And all of them wanted this session. And they wanted this session to be also a, a key session on our biodiversity uh, roadmap, which uh, Ingrid is talking to today. So um, the importance of this session being presented at that plenary, I think, is very, very significant in itself. And of course, um, Daring Cities, you're welcome to go and have a look at the Daring Cities. Um, you can just Google it, really, and it will take you to pre-recordings of many of those very key sessions, fantastic, interesting sessions. If you missed this one, I would really recommend you go and have a look at it. Um, it was also another moment to really highlight the Edinburgh um, uh, process and also the, the, the declaration that came out of that process, which Scotland led and which we, ICLI and so many others supported. Um, and, and are very collectively proud of. And um, there was a strong call um, by, by many of the people that spoke in this panel to also dare cities and dare regions to actually um, sign up to the Edinburgh Declaration as a living document. So Ingrid, we can move the slides along. Um, yeah, so just to say that it was a high level session, maybe just move back slightly quickly that we can see the title of the session. Um, it was focused on, on the 22nd of October, it was focused on um, uh, um, towards adopting a renewed decision on local and subnational governments at the Biodiversity COP. Of course, our constituency mm -hmm. is very clear. And I think all the, the certainly the two open-ended working group chairs and um, the executive secretary of the CBD know very well that our constituency has asked us to lobby on their collective behalf for a new, renewed, strong um, uh, and dedicated decision on local and subnational governments when we come to COP15 next year. So let's move on. You can see the Daring Cities branding there. And um, just to say who the speakers were, we were very honored to have uh, Mr. Zhang, um, who is the president of IUCN, and also coming from the local government as background um, in, in previous uh, uh, hats that he's worn um, and, and uh, positions that he filled. He was also the former Lord Mayor of Zhuxu a metropolitan city, big city in China. And uh, Mr. Zhang has always been a, a very close friend of Eccles in his role also as president of IUCN. And it was a real pleasure to hear from the IUCN community of which Eccles is a member, uh, an active member of course as well, but to hear from the IUCN community about the importance of the urban dimension in nature and about their work in cities with nature through the um, IUCN Urban Alliance, but also through um, many years of working on nature-based solutions in cities and making the connect again between climate change action and um, um, uh, the crisis, the environmental crisis that we're in. And many speakers like Mr. Zhang also pointed out the link uh, between all of, all of these two agendas, the SDGs, but also um, spoke about the COVID-19 green recovery. 
it was very good to make all those connections in the session. We were also joined by the Scottish Government, represented by Mr Keith Connell, who is the Deputy Director of Natural Resources Division in the Scottish Government. And really, I mean, I think collectively from our community, um, you know, just a very great note of appreciation once more to Scotland for stepping forward as a state, as, as one of ours, to, to drive this uh, Edinburgh process. Thank you to everybody that uh, uh, participated in it and for that fantastic outcome document, the Edinburgh Declaration. And if you have not seen it yet, I think we will put the um, link in the chat box. And uh, really, if there are cities and regions who are ready to commit, and we dare them too, in the spirit of daring cities, please commit put your name to the Edinburgh Declaration, because this is a very, very broad, participatory, open, democratic process that has taken place over many months and has led us as a community of local and subnational government uh, uh, representatives to put our voice uh, behind the Edinburgh Declaration in terms of what we ask and what we say should happen in, um, in um, Kunming at COP15. And thank you very much, Mr. Keith Connell, who represented the um, Secretary of Environment uh, on that day for us. And then, of course, Mr. Henri uh, Paul Normandine, who is um, uh, the, uh, a diplomat working in the um, as Director of International Relations in the Office of the uh, Mayor um, of Montreal, Mayor Valerie Plant. Um, who, of course, is ITLI's Global Ambassador for Local Biodiversity Action. And Mr. Henri Paul Normandine, of course, spoke um, about what's happening in Montreal, but he also highlighted specifically a key aspect of multi-level governance and the importance of multi-level governance um, in advocating for what our constituency wants, but also for states to take the leadership, nations, parties to the convention to take the leadership in terms of ensuring that their um, um, local and subnational governments are fully in, uh, involved and actually named um, for specific roles and contributions and responsibilities in an enabling way through their national biodiversity strategy and action plans, um, as they should be in the NDCs for climate. And um, speaking about that multi-level governance, um, Mr. Norman Dean also highlighted the very close relationship with the government of Quebec, and of course, indeed, with the government of Canada. And it's fantastic to have um, Montreal, uh, our, our vibrant mayor, Valerie Plant, passionate, vibrant um, for the biodiversity and many, many other global agendas. Um, it's wonderful to, to have a base in Montreal, which is also the home to the CBD Secretariat. So there's a very good cross-pollination um, happening there um, at all times. And uh, thank you very much for Montreal, the sterling contributions that you are making to this process. Um, we can move to the next slide which will show us a few more of the speakers. We also had, you can see it's a very, very high level panel here. Yeah? We also had Mr. Robbie Beaver, who is a member of ENVI, the Commission of the Environmental Committee of, of the Regions. A committee of the Regions in Europe is very well known for its great advocacy work with, uh, with regions and, and um, um, cities across Europe, but also for the political advocacy work in Brussels with the European Parliament, where they have active voting seats. And um, so is uh, uh, Robbie is, of course, also a member of the Bettenberg Municipal Council in Luxembourg. But Robbie really focused on uh, the very strong and, and forward thinking and very ambitious um, position that the European Union is taking when it comes to nature and biodiversity, as they are indeed also on climate. And um, through people like Robbie and through the Committee of Regions, etc., we are ensuring that um, the voice of local and subnational governments is not only heard, but also actually clearly written in to the ambitions 
um, of the European Union, which is something many of our other regions can aspire to. So thank you, Mr. Beaver, for your wonderful work um, in the Committee of Regions um, and your wonderful work also with the European Commission and in the European Union context altogether. And then again, filtering that down to on the ground action in our regions and cities across the European continent and globally as a leader for this process. So it was a wonderful intervention we had from Mr. Beaver. And again, please do go and watch this if you have not um, been able to attend the webinar itself. Mr. Sergio Graf, who is the Vice President of Regions 4 for America and Secretary of Environment um, of the state of uh, Jalisco in Mexico, gave a very powerful and passionate input about uh, the work of Regions 4, but also about what's happening in his state and how they are working also in a multi-level governance way with so many other local governments as well as national government and internationally. And as we know, Regions 4 is a real champion and a close ally of ICLI as a network um, for many years now, co-hosted our last um, COP in, in Egypt with us and um, really also driving the advocacy agenda towards COP15 with vigor and um, with strength. And uh, Mr. Sergio Graf made a fantastic input on the day, focusing again on the very, very important role of regions. Um, we uh, know that, um, of course, in the biodiversity field, um, cities and regions need to work very, very closely together because biodiversity doesn't know cadastral boundaries of where a city starts and where another city begins. So um, a landscape-based approach to nature-based um, options and solutions and to green recovery and to biodiversity um, protection and enhancement and restoration of ecosystems really needs to happen with regions and cities seamlessly working together. And that's why we value the relationship with all three these uh, bodies that uh, are represented by these three gentlemen you see. I'm turning to the last one, but not the least, His Excellency Haideko Omura. Governor Omura is, of course, the governor of Aichi Prefecture in Japan. And Aichi, what an iconic prefecture, what an iconic moment we had in Nagoya, which is the city in Aichi. Um, Aichi will always be known as the state, the prefecture um, in the world that gave its name to the Aichi biodiversity targets, which we are all uh, following and which we are all committed to attain. Unfortunately, um, the outlook does not look very positive for attaining these uh, very um, uh, targets set in Nagoya in 2011 at the COP at the time when the IG targets came into life. And therefore, there's much work to be done. And there's nobody better to embed that passion and ongoing commitment that is needed than Governor Omura himself through his um, global leadership that he's taking with a group of global um, frontrunner regional governments across the world, the Goals Group. Um, but Mayor, uh, Governor Mura shows his passion every time that he speaks. And he's talking about action and action now. He's the one that says, no more words, let's do, and we can do it together. So we are always very inspired to hear from Governor Mura. And uh, it's incredibly important that the IGHI targets are kept alive and the spirit of that moment when the world agreed on the Aichi targets is kept alive. And for me, it's embodied in Governor Omura. So Governor Omura is somebody we all look up to and we really value it. He's, he's, he's very insightful and commitment statements that he made um, during the session. We can move to the next slide. Um, and I think, yeah, that's just the proceedings of how the event ran. But again, I would encourage you, please go and have a look and join us. Um, and I don't know if there is a final slide, Ingrid. Um, and, and no, it's over to you, Ingrid. But thank you very thank much you. for the opportunity. Thank you. But
Thank you so much, Kubi, and we really appreciate you being here because we know you're um, also at LOX, and I'm going to talk about LOX a little uh, shortly. Um, so you. now just uh, quickly to give you an update on the uh, work that's being done by the informal advisory group on mainstreaming. Um, and basically this relates to a very important and very informative webinar that the CBD uh, organized uh, on the 7th of October. Um, and in fact, this has really been another bumper month uh, uh, for, for biodiversity again, following on from September. October has also been very busy. Um, and one of the big webinars was this one where they reported back on the uh, work in relation to the long-term approach to media uh, mainstreaming, the LTAM, and how this fits in with the global biodiversity framework. So uh, really what they were saying is that um, there's a very close alignment to the uh, five goals and the 20 targets in the global biodiversity framework that have been uh, captured in the uh, zero draft coming out of the open-ended working group meeting in Rome. Um, and then specifically also um, the uh, work that's being done by the SBI3 meeting um, and looking at how uh, mainstreaming obviously being a very important tool and instrument for implementation, how that will be articulated and taken up into the global biodiversity framework. So the, the LTAM is basically um, the, the proposal around what the approach is going to be and it also shows um, how, uh, how the um, mainstreaming um, interventions and initiatives will link with the specific uh, goals and targets and with the other thematic areas in the global biodiversity framework. Um, and then just what they also in the, in the webinar also just raised is or, or presented on is the close linkages between what's happening at the IAG in terms of mainstreaming and linking that to, for example, the work that's been done um, around business, um, around the action agenda, around monitoring reporting, around resource mobilization and a whole range of, of other themes. Um, essentially, just to, to show you in a nutshell, this is what the uh, Global Biodiversity Framework is looking like at the moment, where it focuses on a, a 2030 mission and, and identifies various uh, ways in which implementation can happen. There is, is reference to uh, certain tools around uh, and what the enabling conditions would be, around how to reduce threats, how to meet people's needs, and all of this leads into uh, the 2030 milestones as well as the 2050 goals. And as I said, there are essentially five goals. And ultimately, we're looking at the great impact um, of achieving that 2050 vision is living in harmony with nature. Um, and the next slide is just to show you um, more of the detail. I'm not going to go into, into this now. We simply don't have the time, but this is just to show how things are now looking in, in the framework, in the global biodiversity framework. Um, and then when we speak to specifically the synergies and entry points for mainstreaming and the GBF, I think the important thing is the link or, or the point made around that it's not just horizontal mainstreaming into production sectors, but also the vertical mainstreaming. And that is where all the levels of government and multi-level governance principles come in. Um, there are specific references and links to certain of the targets which are integral to mainstreaming, and these are listed on the slide. Um, and then there are a series of others which have uh, elements or are, um, you know, they are, have implications for mainstreaming as well. And then I think the, the other important point just to make is that the whole theory of change underpinning the global biodiversity framework is very much in tune with or, or linked to mainstreaming and the whole concept of nexus, which has come out of the IPBIS reports. Um, I think the other thing that I just want to highlight here is around mainstreaming. It's the, it's the concept that it's for everybody and everyone's responsibility. So there's also linkages drawn with civil society, the business sector. It's not just something that national governments must do or all levels of, of government. Um, and then the other important one, I think, is the need to, as I said earlier, the, the issue around uh, resource mobilization and finance and innovation being really important considerations to take into account when one talks about mainstreaming. 
Um, so these are just some of the, um, the action areas, the strategy um, uh, areas that have been identified. There are three main ones. Um, and I'm going to just highlight uh, some of the uh, main salient points about these. The first one talks about mainstreaming biodiversity across government and policies. And this is where the whole concept of multi-level governance is embedded. And you can see that there are essentially two action areas. The one talks to the level of values and planning and development processes, et cetera. And then the second one is where we talk about mainstreaming also at the level of finances, budgets, um, and incentives. And I think the important principle here is that it's not good enough just to have clear plans and principles around mainstreaming. You need to have uh, a budgets that will support the implementation of mainstreaming and you have to mainstream biodiversity also into your budget and financial uh, instruments. Um, the second strategy area is taking it outside of the domain of governance and it brings it into business models, the key economic sectors. This is where the focus is more around the production sectors, but it also specifically includes the financial sector. And the two sort of main action areas here is around decreasing uh, negative uh, uh, um, impacts on, on, on uh, the environment and specifically biodiversity as a result of of um, economic development proceeds and, and interventions and increasing the net positive impacts um, on ecosystems, biodiversity, and very importantly, also the link to human health. This is a recent addition, and it's clearly linked to what's happening, the, the crisis at the moment around uh, health and the pandemic and the recognition of the interconnectivity between biodiversity, health, um, well-being and, um, and obviously also climate. Um, and then the, the second action area there in, in this particular strategic area is around financial institutions uh, and you know, applying the biodiversity metrics, uh, incorporating it into risk analyses, uh, blended finance instruments, etc. Um, the third area is around uh, mainstreaming across society. And this is where um, it, it, it's essentially what it does here is to say that mainstreaming is something that everybody should do, whether it is at the level of awareness raising or whether it is about taking steps about sustainable consumption and lifestyles. But it's clearly something that goes beyond just the purview of government or of the business sector. Um, so what they've also identified is certain uh, issues or elements that need to be incorporated to give uh, mainstreaming uh, uh, strength and, and teeth. And they've identified a couple of things here. It's the issue of how to connect mainstreaming into national and sectoral processes, uh, upscaling of tools, um, taking better leverage in terms of some of the um, other uh, in, in interventions uh, around, uh, in, in particularly in the finance and the business sectors. Uh, for example, um, the um, um, agriculture sector, World Economic Forum, etc., and then making stronger linkages and involving more, um, you know, the science base uh, like the IP bears, uh, urban dwellers, uh, right holders, stakeholders, etc. So it's really a very comprehensive and inclusive uh, um, approach. Um, some of the things that will be raised in terms of, of implementation is issues, for example, like a toolbox, uh, how to uh, um, um, institutionalize mainstreaming, um, the, the question, the importance of uh, re the regular review of how successful has this approach been and its action plan, um, and then specifically articulating this action plan in terms of specific actions with milestones and responsibilities as it affects uh, the cross-sector of the whole of government and the whole of society. And that um, it ends my uh, presentation on mainstreaming. Um, and if there are any questions, we can deal with this later. Um, the next thing that I want to just talk to now quickly, and this is really just going to be a sort of a whistle stop tour, is looking at some of the events um, at LOX, as well as some of the other events that have been held in the past. There was an event that was organized by the European Committee of Regions with the South African Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries, which specifically looked at the work that's been done in South Africa around catalyzing local government action and the synergies and linkages that they have with the European Committee of Regions for peer exchange 
um, etc. So uh, this was just a very brief uh, webinar, which was part of the um, European uh, Committee of Regions week, um, and it was one of the side events there. And there was a lot of interest, uh, particularly from other cities in Europe and also South African cities, to share and understand how cities in the north and versus cities in the south are dealing with the issues around nature in cities and biodiversity. Um, and then some of the highlights from Daring Cities, and as Kirby said, there is so much, and there's the, the website you can see at the bottom. Please, I encourage you to go and have a look at that. Um, but essentially, it was a major, and it was a massive event. I mean, we had uh, 4,500 plus participants from over 150 countries, which given the time that we are finding ourselves in, I think is an absolute achievement. Um, there were nearly 100 technical and interactive workshops. Uh, there were the speakers included um, really high level top people. We had the Secretary General um, of the UN. We had seven UN agencies. There were eight national ministers. There were more than 150 mayors, governors, councillors. And that's not even to mention all the academics and the experts and the leaders in, in, in the sort of the, the civil society. Um, these are just some of these uh, amazing quotes and messages that came out from people like Antonio Guterres, um, you know, urging, making the link between climate and health and investing in green jobs. Um, and then one from uh, Valerie Plant um, um, around how to make the link between climate change and biodiversity. Um, and I mean, this is really just a snapshot and I can't do justice to the incredible wisdom and the sharing of, of lessons and solutions and innovations that came out of Daring Cities. Um, just to highlight some of the ones that were specifically focused on nature and cities, there was an event on resource mobilization for nature-based solutions, uh, where we had a fantastic team of experts in the field. Uh, we had Tracy Cumming, who's a fellow South African um, from UNDP Biofin, uh, Katja Karasakis from the OECD, Mark Gao from Capitals Coalition, we had uh, Kimberly Pope from uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, we had Alok uh, Barnwell from the GIF. And it was an incredible discussion. And the importance of this session actually is it's leading into discussions that are ongoing at the moment at LOCS because the central theme of LOCS is around financing, obviously around climate, but also around nature-based solutions and nature in cities. Um, and then there were um, a series of LGMA-related webinars specifically focusing on the COP26 roadmap, multi-level action, uh, the Marrakesh partnership, etc., etc. That was one that was took place on the 20th of October. There was another one on the 21st of October. This was actually one that I know Kubi participated in, and it was really an amazing session around uh, green, greening redesign and recovery. Um, and there was a, the intervention from the Japanese minister around the Global Net Zero Cities Forum, um, and some really amazing stuff coming out of that, as you can see from the information on the slide. Um, and then the final um, outlook uh, or, or the, the, the closing, which held, held on the 28th of October, was sort of really the cherry on top of the, all the other cherries with some amazing interventions. Uh, they also launched the Making Cities Resilient 2030 partnership um, and a whole range of other things that, uh, that happened at the, that session as well. Uh, now, just briefly to touch on LOCS, which is an online forum for leaders um, on strategies uh, for climate action and financing in Africa. And I'm very proud to say that um, it's not just African um, participants, but we have an amazing particip participation around the world. And that's one of the really incredible things about this virtual uh, world that we find ourselves in now, in the sense that we're not constrained about uh, by, by the ability or the funds to move from, let's say, Africa to Europe to attend a conference. We um, are actually opening up the globe and it's become so much smaller as a result of virtual technology. So we're getting a lot more cross-pollination between regions and continents and countries. And the LOCS there is the, the website. And if you haven't yet um, registered, I encourage you please to do so. Um, this is just some of the sessions that are focusing on financing for nature-based uh, uh, climate adaptation. There was a very successful session yesterday. Um, and in fact, not yesterday, on the 3rd. There's another one coming up on the 9th, which is around demystifying 
demystifying climate uh, finance for disaster risk reduction. There is the link. Uh, we will share these uh, certainly in the, uh, um, the, ch the chat box, but also in the email afterwards. Um, and then there's one on the 11th of November, when nature makes sense, um, the economic value of nature for climate, uh, and again, I just want to encourage you to certainly join these, but also the many other sessions that are so interesting. Um, and with this, we've come to the end. Um, so I'm happy to take some questions and answers um, if there are any. And um, I've also just asked um, my um, technical support staff to just share as many of those links as possible. And I think what I must do at this stage is maybe um just see it looks like we do have a question here um oh no it's not a question it's just um the link for registering for locks for africa is has been shared in the chat the chat box um so you are welcome to to have a look at that and i've asked we've also had some of the other links shared in there If there's no questions, I'm not seeing any questions coming up. Okay, I will proceed. Um, and then just, just very briefly, just to end off the, the webinar, um, just to say that um, one of the things that we always um, uh, always say at the end of our webinars is just to remind those of you that are already involved with Cities of Nature to please use the platform as, and engage with the platform. For those of you that are not familiar with Cities of Nature, this is an amazing initiative which uh, provides an online platform um, for cities to share knowledge to learn from others, to go on a journey around how they can be cities that work and plan and implement with nature to improve the quality of life of their citizens, but also the resilience of cities. Um, and it's certainly something that uh, we are uh, continually developing and updating and it's strengthening and enhancing. Um, and then just to say that we also have a website uh, which is a website that uh, we share also with some of our other network partners and it's around the various advocacy interventions and this is where you're going to find many of the um, reports on some of the uh, um, events that we've reported on not only in in this webinar but also through our regular email update series um, there are many of the well in fact all of the declarations um, and the communiques and the interventions that we make at the CBD process meetings, such as the SAPSTA and the SPI meetings and the open-ended working group meetings, they are captured there as well. And there's a lot more uh, information that you can, can find on, on that website. Um, and with that, I've come to the end of my session. I just want to make sure that there are no questions. I can't see. Um, any questions? No, it doesn't seem that we have any further questions. I just want to, yeah, all right. And I think with that, we are actually ending uh, within time. Um, and maybe just before I sign off, I just want to check with my technical team whether they've picked up on any questions. It doesn't seem so. All right. Thank you so much. And um, as I said, uh, we have our next webinar, which will be held on the 3rd of December. Uh, we will, after this webinar, we will send out our regular, uh, to those people that registered, uh, we will send out the links um, and you do get an, an email uh, update also. Um, and then just to encourage you once again, please to immediately go and register for the lock sessions. They are really worthwhile. They've got excellent speakers, fantastic audience engagement, really great discussions. So it's a very worthwhile effort. And the, and the feedback that we've had from people that have participated around the globe has been very positive and very complimentary. 
Thank you so much, and I wish you a good day or evening further. Goodbye. <laughs>